Okay. All right. So uh, last time we were kind of recapping or reviewing where we were um, uh, with um, come on, baby, with identical particles, and I've lost my cursor, mouse. Technology. Are you still there, dummy? Yes, I'm still here. Okay. Let me see what I've got open here. Okay. All right, I'm back. Okay. Uh, so we were recapping uh, where we were as far as identical particles. Um, we talked about how you write down states uh, under this exchange symmetry and how you can use a, a permutation operator <clears throat> to, uh, to basically build uh, what we'll, we'll see later on. You can um, use it to basically build your states once you, once you uh, get beyond uh, n equals 2 number of states. Um, so at, towards the end of last time, we started to talk about uh, the specific case of two electrons, right? Two electron system. And we said that, oh, you guys can't even see this. <laughs> you guys are. Uh, oh, shit. How do I do that? You can see the Settings and uh, display. Use this way. Do you see it? Mirror displays right here. Ah, okay. That's better. Now you guys can see what I'm talking about. Um, this is it's fine. this okay so we all right so we finally uh so we were talking about the two electron system right so this is just a we're just considering two pair uh, a pair of electrons <clears throat> uh in free space and what we were saying was that we could write down the state in terms of uh, a handful of quantum numbers so we could use uh, position space and write down uh state in terms of their position and coordinates but we also have to include spin, so these are particles with spin, so we, when we specify the state, we have to specify the spin. All right, so I started with a general state that I call alpha, and basically uh, just you know, multiplied it by one by using our completeness relation for these states, whatever they, they might be. Um, <clears throat> and we defined what the position space wave function to be just the part of alpha being overlapped with the spatial parts, right? Spatial part, uh, spatial coordinates, and so what we we could do is we were able to uh, kind of write this in a more uh, compact manner, and we define some coefficient, which is the overlap of the full state with just the spatial part. Okay, so we said, all right, well let's let's consider the case where uh, the total spin operator uh, commutes with the Hamiltonian, and in that case, just like we saw when we studied the uh, the hydrogen atom, when we talked about orbital angular momentum and things like that, anytime you have a situation like this, you you can write the states uh, in a separated form, right? So you can write your full wave function in terms of a spatial part, right, and in terms of a spin part, right? So for us before, uh, this, you know, if you think back to the hydrogen atom, uh, this would be like the, maybe, you know, maybe the radial piece or the, uh, I think it's kind of uh, the radio and the angular piece, and this would be like, you know, uh, spherical harmonics, say, right? This is a kind of a, a more, uh, kind of a uh, more restricted case, but that's that's the analogy, all right? Okay, and so so we have two spin one half particles, and if you go back and, re you know, review uh, how you add those spins, right, to get the total spin, you'd see that you end up with a possibility of four states, Three uh, <clears throat> are symmetrical, right? So symmetrical in the sense of 
interchanging particle on particle two. We call those the triplet, and one is anti-symmetrical, so meaning that if we flip-flop the, part the particles, we pick up a minus sign, and that guy we call the singlet, right? But the thing that we know from last time is that the total wave function uh, for uh, for a system of fermions has to be uh, totally anti-symmetric, right? So that means that if we know for, you know, somehow that the, the particles are in a triplet spin state, then that automatically tells us that phi has to be anti-symmetric, right? Because the product of those two uh, wave functions has to be totally anti-symmetric. Okay, all right. So we can still interpret, uh, you know, the spatial part as we would, you know, in a single particle case. All right, so we can interpret the, the, uh, the same modulus squared as the probability that we'll find electron one in one part, you know, one uh, in one region of space and particle two in another region of space. Um, <clears throat> but it's a little different when you have to deal with these symmetries. Okay, so let me let me let's work through an example, and uh, <clears throat> we're going to consider the case, the simplified case, right now where these two particles don't interact with each other. These two electrons are just free electrons, but there is some possible external uh, field, whether it be electric or magnetic or, or something else, okay? And so in that case, we can separate the, the spatial wave function, right? So we, we have this wave function that uh, is a, dependent on x1 and x2. That's the total space, spatial wave function. But we can split that in this case where there's no uh, interaction between the two, we can split those into two single particle states, right? <clears throat> right? But this is where it gets tricky because we have to keep in mind that we're dealing with identical particles, and so we have to obey, you know, the whatever symmetry uh, these particles or whatever uh, statistics these, these particles obey. So uh, when we write uh, out this product, uh, we have to be a little careful, right? So we have to either write it as a totally symmetric state or a totally anti-symmetric state. Okay, so this is uh, the case where we have separable state, and let me do it with the cursor so Dummy sees what I'm doing. So this is uh, our total state, right? And I'm rewriting it as a, a linear combination of the two. Uh, the plus would be my uh, my symmetric state, right? And my minus would be my anti-symmetric state. Okay, and this factor of one over square root of two is just a normalization factor. Okay, so I'm assuming that these guys on their own are normalized. Okay, so then uh, we can take this guy in the case where we are able to separate the, the wave function and take the modulus squared, right? So plug in our expression. Here I get the plus and the minus, right? And square this thing out. And when I do that, I get, you know, uh, one term that's like the probability of particle one to be at x1. Uh, times the, part, the probability of particle 2 be x2, plus the probability vice versa, right? Does vice versa have a past tense? I don't know. But it, it's vice versa. Uh, <clears throat> but we also have this kind of uh, cross term, right? And it comes with a plus or minus sign depending on uh, if we're working with a uh, symmetrical or anti-symmetrical state. And this thing itself, the stuff inside of here is called the exchange density just for um, historical reasons, okay? So let's ask ourselves what, you know, what does the spatial wave function look like in particular cases, all right? So if the electrons are in a spin triplet, so that means the spin part of the wave function is symmetric, right? So the uh, total wave function has to be, I mean, the, the spatial wave function has to be anti-symmetric, right? So that means that we take this minus sign, right? So that would be, that would give us the probability but what happens if we try to take particle one and particle two and move them uh, very close together? Like try to put them at the, you know, basically the same position in space. What, what would happen if I, if I just let, say, let x2 go to x1 here with this minus sign? What's going to happen? I'll give you a second to stare at it. So I'm going to have 
these things are going to be basically the same, right? So I'm letting x2 go to x1, right? So these two guys would combine. These two guys, so this stuff in here, I can multiply together and I'm going to get a phi1 squared or phi2 squared, right? But I get this minus sign. Right? So as I take x2 to x1, in other words, if I take electron 2 and try to put it close to x1, particle x1, in the case where they're in the, you know, this symmetric state, the probability goes to zero. The probability that I would find those two particles uh, very close to each other is very, very small, right? And that's the what in action? Uh, Poly exclusion principle, right? We, we have the particles in, uh, in a symmetric uh, wave, wave uh, spin state, right? <clears throat> so, you know, think of it as like the, sp the easiest one to think of is like spin up, spin up, right? So they both have the same spin. So that means that what, whatever is left over to describe the state, in this case, it's the spatial part, it can't be the same, right? It has to be different. Because if you try to make it the same, the wave function is going to collapse, or the, in this case, the probability, okay? And in the case of, in the other case where you have the spins in, uh, in a singlet, so this is where you have uh, spin up, spin down, and um, the electrons are, uh, I mean, the, uh, the spin state is anti-symmetric. Then that means that we want uh, uh, the spatial part to be symmetric, right? So the spin state is anti-symmetric. We want the spatial part to be symmetric, so the total wave function is anti-symmetric, right? And in that case, what happens is the probability gets enhanced, right? So the probability gets enhanced. Uh, because of this plus sign, okay? So when particles are, or when the electrons are in, uh, you know, opposite spin states, they like to be close. They, they don't mind being close together, okay? Okay. Okay, any questions on that? So this is just a, this was just a simple case where we had a system of, of two free electrons, and we didn't let them interact uh, with each other. And later we'll come back later on and we'll add a whole bunch of a whole bunch more of electrons and see what happens. Okay. But what I want to do next is talk about uh, the helium atom. Okay. <clears throat> so we've talked, so we just talked about this two electron system. Uh, it's, you know, you, it's not possible really to, 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 you know, to build an experiment where you only have two electrons, right. That don't interact with each other. It's, it's, it's impossible. So what we have, uh, you know, the, 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 I guess the best real world example of a two electron system is gonna be the helium atom, right? So here you got a nucleus, a very heavy nucleus. It's made of two protons and two neutrons. I don't know, I don't remember. And then two electrons, right? <clears throat> the point is that the nucleus is very heavy, right? And so the, the nucleus isn't going to, uh, oh yeah, there's a period. Uh, the nucleus is very heavy, right? And so it's not going to uh, take uh, play a role in uh, as far as the dynamics go, right? So we're not going to have to worry about writing down a uh, kinetic term for the nucleus, right? But it will prov uh, provide that external potential, that external field that we were talking about earlier, okay? Um, <clears throat> the uh, But in this case, the helium, uh, the, the electrons, we're going to have to consider the case where they interact with each other, right? Because they're going to be close enough that they're going to... Uh, feel each other, and I think we talked about the helium atom when we did uh, uh, the variational method, and we'll, we'll do that today too as a review. Um, but what happens is for one electron, what it sees basically is a screened potential, right? It doesn't see the full uh, potential coming from the nucleus, okay? All right, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about the helium atom. It gives us a real-world example of a system of identical particles. Uh, but there's a bonus here, and it, the bonus is that, that we can't solve it exactly, okay? We can't solve the helium atom exactly, so we have to resort to approximation methods, okay? So this gives us uh, a chance to uh, play around again with uh, our old friends, perturbation theory and the variational method, okay? So there's no, there's no getting away from uh, approximation techniques. Okay, so this is our system, all right? So it looks a lot like what I had before, so I can put this nucleus uh, at the origin, right? And then specify the positions of uh, electron one and electron two like this, 
right, where the distance between the two, the relative distance, is given by R12. Okay, so I'm going to, I should say there, there's a couple steps in here where uh, I'm going to pull uh, relations out of nowhere, okay? So don't get caught up on uh, where these relations come from. It's not that important, but um, uh, it's, just, it's just math. Don't worry about it, okay? Um, okay, so what we have is our the Hamiltonian that we had before, basically, which describes the kinetic energy of the two electrons. We have the uh, Coulomb potential for each of the electrons, and then we have their interaction term, right? And the interaction term is a plus because these guys are uh, have the same sign, and so it's a repulsive uh, interaction, okay? And I'll be using R1, uh, R2, and R12 to just describe uh, the, the distance, the magnitude of the distance <clears throat> for the particles, you know, from the nucleus or from each other. Okay, so uh, what I want to do is first consider the case that we just did, bless you, uh, uh, where we neglect the, in, the, the inner particle interaction, the inter-electron interaction, right? And we just saw there that the Schrodinger equation is separable, Right, so we can write the total wave function as just two hydrogen wave functions, okay? Uh, and all we need to do really is basically take our, you know, the solutions that we have for the hydrogen atom and replace uh, z equals one with z equals two, okay? That's basically all you have to do in this separable case. Um, but now we wanna include spin, right? And you can, you can easily see that the total spin is a constant of motion because there's no spin dependence in the uh, in the Hamiltonian, so if it if, if the spin operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, then this thing's a constant of motion, and we have, we can specify uh, the state by these simultaneous eigenkets of the Hamiltonian and the spin operator. Okay, uh, right. And from our earlier discussion, we know that the spin the spin state is either going to be a singlet, uh, which is anti-symmetric, or a triplet state, which is symmetric. <clears throat> okay, so let's consider the particular case, or this, the yeah, the particular case where both electrons are in the ground state. Okay, so n equals one, which means that l equals zero and m equals zero. Okay, so we have a system with uh, both the electrons in the ground state. And if you're, you know, a chemistry buff, you might call this the one s. What do you call it? The one s two state or the one s? It's not squared, right? I don't remember. It's been so long since it's a chemistry, but um, anyway, so the, the notation is this, right? So we're in the n equals one, s means that L is equal to zero, and two means that we have two electrons in that, in this state, in that state, okay? <clears throat> and this guy is necessarily symmetric, right? There's, um, uh, it's, just, it's just what it is, right? It's just uh, the product of the two uh, spatial parts, right? And so that tells us right off the bat that the electrons have to be in a spin singlet. Right? In other words, they have to be ones up and ones down. Right? And that you should remember from, um, from chemistry or you know, from whatever, okay? All right, so we know what the, the, the total wave function is. In the case, this, so this is a simplified case where we're not allowing the electrons to interact with each other, okay? So we've, we've got a total wave function that's a kind of a product of two uh, one particle or two hydrogen atom uh, wave functions and the spin operator or the spin state, which is a singlet in this case. So we can plug in uh, the expression that we have for hydrogen wave functions and write it like this, right? Uh, where uh, here Z now is not equal to one, but it's equal to two. It's just a uh, numerical shift, okay? So we've got our wave function uh, for, the to for the ground state, okay? And we're, so we can go and try to compute the expectation by the Hamiltonian, in other words, the ground state energy. And what we get is uh, when I calculate and put in the numbers, I get about minus 110 electron volts. And it turns out that uh, that the, uh, the true experimental value is a lot larger, right? It's larger by 30 electron volts or so, okay? So what that's telling us right off the bat is that you know, neglecting this interaction between the electrons is not a good approximation, okay? So we have to put this interaction term back in, okay? So we wanna put this interaction term back in and try to solve it. And 
the problem is, like I said in the beginning, once you put that interaction in, uh, the problem becomes uh, uh, non-soluble or unsolvable, or you can't solve it. Okay, analytically, you could do it numerically if you wanted, and that's typically probably what people do. Okay, uh, right. So, well, we're not going to try to do it uh, numerically. We're going to try to do it using our approximation techniques. Okay, so the first thing we're going to try is perturbation theory. So this is um, time independent, non degenerate perturbation theory. Okay, and our, so we're going to break the Hamiltonian into the simple piece and the small piece. Right, the simple piece would be the Hamiltonian that we had after we dropped that interaction term. All right, so it would be these first four terms. All right, and we already know the solution for that. It's this. Okay, and the, the, um, the small term is going to be this Coulomb interaction between the two electrons, okay? So what we want to do is compute the first order energy shift uh, 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 um, to the ground state, okay? And if you remember, that's just basically uh, the expectation value of our interaction between the, the, the uh, simple eigenstates, right? The simple ground state eigenstates, okay? So in other words, what I want to do is, is take this thing and I want to integrate it. So, so the fact that I'm computing this matrix element, but it's uh, an integration over these wave functions. Uh, so I've plugged in two, two factors of the wave function, right? And here's my interaction term being multiplied in, okay? So what I need to do is I need to do this integral, okay? And uh, it's, this is not an easy integral. <laughs> This is an integral that you might see in Jackson, or uh, I think it does show up in, in Jackson, uh, electro, electro uh, the, the Jackson book, not my book, the, the, the other, the bad Jackson, okay? <clears throat> the evil Jackson. Um, so the, the reason that it's hard is because this is because this R12 term, right? Think about what R12 is, and it looks something like this. It's the square root of R1 squared plus R2 squared minus 2 R1 R2 times cosine of the angle between the two, All right? So the angle uh, between these two is just, a, is just a constant. We don't have to, uh, well, it's not a constant, right? It's a product or it's, it's some linear combination of how we define, uh, let's go back to the picture real quick, All right? So, so for us, gamma would be this, the, the angle between these two, but gamma is really, uh, you know, if we called this theta one, this angle here, uh, or that's theta two, right? And then theta one, then gamma would be what? Theta one minus theta two, right? So gamma is some combination of theta one and theta two, which we're integrating over, okay? So all that is just to say that this integral is really, really hard, okay? Because the, the angular integrations are hidden in here. So what we do is we're going to use mathematical trick, okay? So this is one of those that I said don't worry about. Uh, but you can rewrite this thing in terms of uh, 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 summation that looks like this. So you're summing over uh, the angular uh, uh, orbital angular momentum uh, quantum number. Okay, so this comes this goes back to the idea that you can, you know, when you have a, a, a some function that's a piece of, you know, radial times or radial and angular variables, you can always write it in terms of uh, Legendre polynomials, uh, but in this case it's a little tougher. So uh, the the prefactor of that of that Legendre polynomial is going to be some uh, ratio of uh, what I call r lesser and r greater, where r lesser and r greater is the smaller or the larger of r one and r two. We are using it. Okay, that's what I yeah, that's what I thought. I, when I was when I were you know, this is in, I don't know what book this came from, but this is in the quantum book. But every time I look at it, I just have flashbacks of E and M. Yeah. I just remember. We're using it. Okay, good. So you want to come up to the board and prove it? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, no, so, so we'll, we'll just use it. Okay. So we're going to rewrite it like this. Okay. And in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to use the fact that, um, you can uh, rewrite uh, this thing, and I wrote down the name of it. It's, hold on. 
Yeah, so this just comes, so we're going to rewrite. Uh, remember, this thing is a gamma is a, you know, some combination of theta 1 and theta 2 and phi 1 and phi 2, which I, I didn't say earlier. Um, uh, so what we can do is use the, it's called the addition theorem of spherical harmonics to rewrite this Legendre polynomial like this. Okay, so I have uh, these two spherical harmonics. One's a uh, 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 function of, you know, particle one and uh, coordinates and the other's particle two's coordinates. Okay. Uh, so with that said, I'll, um, and then, okay, so then there's another trick where, <clears throat> uh, so we're going to have these integrals, right? Where So we're going to be integrating over the uh, solid angle of particle one or particle two. You're doing all the same stuff? Okay, good. Uh, uh, so this is just in general, right? So you can use this trick, which is basically using uh, the orthogonality or, or orthonormality of the spherical harmonics, right? So you basically multiply and divide by the square root of 4 pi, and 1 over square root of 4 pi is y0, 0, right? And so then you can uh, do this integration, and it tells you that L and M have to be 0, right? So it's a little trick. Um, to simplify your lives. And so you can put all that stuff together and you can, um, once you do the integration, uh, you'll end up with this. So we all we have left now are the integrations over R1 and R2. And so these two terms are coming from this sum, uh, this sum right here, the sum over the R lesser and R greater, right? So this would be uh, the case where R1 is greater and this is the case where R2 is greater. Okay, so that's why we have two terms there. Uh, and there's some other algebra going, going on here, okay? But this, the good news is that now we can do this integration, right? And so it, it's, it's, it's really simple. I can do it in my head, so I just wrote down the answer. <laughs> uh, I'm, just, I'm just joking. Uh, so, so the answer looks something like this, okay? And so when you put it all back together, Remember, what we're trying to do is compute the first order energy shift to uh, the ground state. Right? And what I get when I put all that stuff together is this kind of mess. So here's prefactors coming from that original integral that we have. We get some four pi's coming in from the angular integrations. And then we get this thing from the radial integration. Right? And then when I multiply all that stuff out, I'm just left with this thing. Nice little expression. I know what the value of E is. I know what the value of the pore radius is. So I can plug those values in and get a number, right? And what I find when I add this to the unperturbed energy, which was minus 108 or something like that, I find that um, I get down to about not minus 74.8 electron volts. So now, using just for, you just using just uh, first order perturbation theory, I'm already within five percent. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so that's that's using perturbation theory, and, and so you know you, you could do this, and depending on what the experimental errors are, um, I'm, I'm guessing nowadays they're probably really really small. Uh, so you would have to go to next order in perturbation theory, can compute the second order uh, energy shifts, okay? Uh, and hopefully, you know, they would it would start to converge on the experimental um, values, okay? So that's not too shabby. Right, we got we did simple calculation and we got within five five percent. All right, so now let's shift gears and try to do this same calculation. In other words, try to calculate the ground state energy uh, <clears throat> when the when the electrons are allowed to interact. But in this case, let's use the variational method. Okay, everybody remember the variational method? It's been a long time, but so I'll I'll, I'll review it as we go through. Hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when in doubt, guess, right? So this is, so so variational methods, just educated guessing, okay? Um, so, and, you know, to, to, to guess the wave function, we try to use our physical, you know, our kind of uh, physical intuition, right? And, uh, let's see, right? So, so this goes back to what I was talking about earlier, that, if you just, you know, sat on one of the electrons, <coughs> basically what it sees is a Coulomb potential, right? It's a combination of Coulomb potential from the nucleus uh, and the Coulomb potential from the other electron, right? 
And so what it sees basically is kind of a screened potential. And by screened, I mean it's not as strong as what the potential just from the nucleus would be, right? So uh, what we might try to do is use uh, write the, the wave function as a product of two um, single particles, you know, single part uh, hydrogen atom wave functions, but use the z as kind of our variational uh, parameter, if you will, right? So that'll be the parameter that we'll try to um, uh, minimize, right, uh, with respect to. Okay, so in other words, I'm going to take uh, wherever I had z before, when I write down the, the wave function, I'm going to replace it with z effective, and z effective is what we're going to uh, uh, optimize, uh, use to optimize our calculation, okay? So in other words, uh, my wave function is going to look like this. So this is my trial wave function. Remember, that's what the squiggle on top means. And so this is the product of two single uh, hydrogen atom uh, wave functions. And I've replaced Z with Z, uh, Z effective. Okay. And so what we want to do is we want to compute basically the, the uh, expectation value uh, of our Hamiltonian with respect to this guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> so in this case, we have, we you know we want to uh, compute this thing, right? And probably the easiest thing to do is break it into pieces, right? And consider first the the kinetic term, and then later the potential term. Okay, so uh, the kinetic term, uh, when I plug it in, uh, I'll have the wave function starred here times the kinetic operator, and Time, uh, operating on the wave function, right? And um, since there's no angular dependence, right? There's no angular dependence in our wave function, right? Uh, then what that means is that these uh, um, op these operators just become the uh, basically the R uh, derivatives with respect to R. Okay. So we just need to carry out these integral or carry out these derivatives, right? Notice it's a sum over both. One and two, and uh, let's see. Uh, once I do that, I get something that looks like this. It's it's important to note that um, no, okay. So this is I'm missing. Oh, this is two. Sorry, I can't even read my own handwriting. So this is two, and then it's the effective. Okay, but when the smoke clears, you you can you're able to uh, do this integration uh, once you've carried out those derivatives, and you get something that looks like this mess, okay, and you can simplify it and get it down to something that looks like this, okay. All right, and then uh, next what you want to do is consider the potential part, okay. The potential part, it's, it's a little tricky because, you know, we wrote down our wave function in terms of the z effective, right, but we know what z is in real life. z is equal to 2, right, for, for the helium atom, right. So you have to make sure that when you compute the potential part, uh, you don't say when you write down the potential term that you're in, you know that you're integrating over. Don't mistakenly call this z effective because it's not. Right? It's we know what it is. Okay. So this term right here. Okay. So anyway, so that, that's the tricky part about that. But once you plug it in, you can do these integrations uh, because we're not, uh, you know, we don't we're not considering the interaction between these two. Okay. And so you can do the integrations pretty easily, and you once you simplify everything, you get something that looks like this. So that's the reason why I have a, a factor of z here is coming from the potential, and this z effective is coming from the wave function. Okay. Uh, and then finally, so I've, what I've done is split off uh, the kinetic from the simple part of the potential, which is the potential just due to the uh, interaction with the nucleus, and then the interaction, uh, and then we have left the interaction term, okay? But this turns out to be the same thing that we just calculated when we were doing perturbation theory, right? So I can just write down the answer, okay? And what I get is this thing, okay? And this should be the same thing we got last uh, when we did perturbation theory. All right, so what I find is what we call big H bar, which is basically just the expectation value of our Hamiltonian with respect to these uh, trial states. Uh, when I put it all together, it looks something like this, okay? 
So we've got H bar, big H bar, and now the next step is to minimize with respect to our parameters, right? And so in this case, we only have one parameter, it's Z effective. So we wanna take a derivative, set it equal to zero, and solve for Z effective, All right? So that's what I do. And I find that Z effective is two minus five over 16, right? And at that point, you should ask yourself, does this make sense, right? Um, and, in, and the answer should be yes, right? Because we would expect Z effective, that screened potential to be weaker, right? And what controls that, you know, basically the, the, the scale of that potential is the Z, right? The Z, the number of protons, okay? And so we see that it's less than two, and so we have some faith that we're doing at least something correct or correctly, right? So we find that Z effective, once I put, put the numbers in, is like 1.7, okay? And so finally, what I do is I take the Z effective and I plug it back in to my uh, expectation value of big H bar, and I find that I get minus 77.5, right? And so again, you see that uh, using, uh, using the variational method with just a very simple guess uh, as far as, you know, what the wave function would look like, we get within 1% or so of the actual value. Okay, and so you can see why uh, this technique is, you know, uh, used by chemists a lot because it's it's easy, so they can understand it. Um, but it gives it gives pretty good results. Okay, um, <clears throat> right. Okay, so that's where. Uh, so I'm going to end there. Okay, but don't you know? I don't want you to go away thinking that perturbation theory is crap compared to the variational method because it's not. Right, the variational method is good for estimating ground state energies. Right, perturbation theory is good for a lot of things. Okay, so even though you know we were off by five percent or so in the perturbation tech, you know, theory uh, technique, uh, you know, it has a lot more applications. Okay, all right. So next time uh, we'll talk about excited states of helium. Okay, so we'll start to talk about like where one of the electrons is in a higher uh, orbital or higher whatever you call it, energy level. <coughs> and we'll start to talk about systems with n greater than two. Okay, so we'll start to talk about large or, you know, systems with a large number of electrons or, you know, bosons. Okay. All right. So that's all I've got for today. Um, there be any questions? No. Okay. So I I recorded this. So it'll be on. It'll I'll put it on YouTube. The notes are already in the Dropbox. Uh, so if you have any questions, let me know. Okay. All right.